5, verses 4 and 5. Matthew 5, 4 and 5, as we continue looking at Matthew 5, 1 through 12, what is known as the Beatitudes. We're a blessed people. Matthew 5, 4 and 5 reads, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's pray. Let's pray for those not feeling well tonight as we pray as well. Father, we're grateful to you for the privilege that we have to be in the house of the Lord. We're thankful that we can be here to worship you and to learn of your word and to draw closer to you. And I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just strengthen us and help us as we face the trials of life that come our way. And we pray, Father God, that you would just touch those that are not feeling well in body, those that are recovering, Lord, from sickness and surgery and different things. And just pray, Father God, that you would just keep your hand upon the churches that have not been able to have service this week. And I just pray, God, that you would just strengthen us and speak to our hearts tonight through your word. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at these two tonight, these two be attitudes. Uh, first one, blessed are they that mourn, and then blessed are the meek. Blessed are they that mourn. So as we look at society's heroes, just take a look at those, just to name a few that people set up as heroes or ones that they look up to. Maybe they have the poster on their wall, sp uh, professional sports figures, movie stars, uh, the elite, whatever category you want to put that in, uh, wealthy business owners, gifted thinkers, talented artists. Maybe you could even throw a uh, megachurch pastor in there. Just people who uh, their resume would show that as uh, being successful, that, that, that they're important or they're somebody. Now, if man was building a kingdom, that's who they're going after. If man is looking to establish a, ki a kingdom, that is who they're looking to make and recruit as their citizens. But we have to realize, Scripture tells us, God doesn't think like we think. His ways are not our ways. And when it really comes down to it, God's value system and our attributes are not the same as God's. God does not value the same attributes that man values. God's not... Uh, one man just put it this way, that God does not call the equipped, he equips the call. And so he's looking very differently. And the Apostle Paul, while dealing with the Corinthians, now when you begin to study Corinthians, I, I believe uh, after we finish up on these uh, series uh, over the next couple of months, maybe around spring, uh, we're going to start a series on uh, Corinthians. But you begin to look at Corinthians. Just I've been studying and reading a little bit on that the last few weeks. Uh, Paul was not a light man by the Corinthians. They had uh, very uh, many of them had some opinions of Paul uh, because he corrected them and he let them know where they stood. He didn't sugarcoat it and he let them know where they stood. Well, he was writing to this group of believers and, and the reason they didn't like Paul is because this group of believers and uh, boasted in their gifts. And this is what he stated to them as he wrote a letter to them and he started off the, the what we know as the first chapter of Corinthians and the latter part is the, the latter parts of the verses there, chapter there, 26 through 31. Listen to what Paul wrote to them. He said, For ye... See your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are ours that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So if you're just simply stating what 
Paul is writing there, he's saying the kingdom of God is given to the weak, to the despised, and to those who are nothing. Why? So that God may receive the glory. It's not that someone uh, could say, this is what I did, and this is what I accomplished. So the Beatitudes uh, that we were studying describe not only us as the children of the kingdom, but the Beatitudes uh, also describe the character of the king. How many knows that every kingdom has a king? And so it's describing not just us as the children or the citizens or the people that make up the kingdom, but it's describing the character of the kings. Now, the prophet Isaiah described that king, our king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, or to the Jewish people known as the Messiah, whether some of them want to accept him yet or not. Uh, this is what he said about him in Isaiah 53, 3 through 5. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our our sorrows, uh, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. It has nothing to do really what I'm talking about tonight, but that last statement says, and with his stripes we are healed. Healed. Can we just stop right there? I, I did not have this plan, did not uh, plan this, but as soon as I just read that, it just felt a check in my spirit. Will you stand with me all over this house? Uh, then let's, let's just take time right now and claim that word of God. And with his stripes, we are healed. We've got this COVID, flu, everything is going around. Churches are closing up, and people are sick. There's a, a, a widowed pastor's wife that's in the hospital struggling for her life. And you, you know, within, within each one of us individuals in this building, each one of us could probably name at least 10 people each that has been affected here recently by this new strand of COVID or by the flu or by strep throat or by some form of sickness. Uh, can we just take authority over that? And how do we take authority over it? Because we are citizens of this king and his kingdom. And let's just claim this word right now. And with his stripes, we are healed. Heavenly Father, we claim the stripes that was bore by your son at Calvary, not just for our healing. Obviously, those of us in this building tonight probably feel pretty good in our bodies. But Father God, we all know someone that is not feeling well in their bodies tonight. Whether they've been affected by COVID, whether they've been affected by the flu, whether they've been affected by a car accident or whatever, has put them in the state of injury. Oh, Lamb of God, that uh, young girl, Lord, that we've been praying for, the Tim's family uh, and others that are just suffering from all kinds of different things. We claim this word right now in the name of Jesus. And with his stripes, uh, we are healed. Uh, and with his stripes, uh, they are healed. Uh, it's already been taken care of uh, in, in the atonement. It's already been taken care of uh, at Calvary, Father God. And we just take hold of that and claim it. In the name of Jesus, uh, amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. God, receive all glory, uh, honor, and praise. Uh, Jesus proclaimed, blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they that mourn. Isaiah said it, and with his stripes we were healed. He said the chastisement of our peace is upon him. Described all of that. Jesus himself knew sorrow. He knew sorrow. He prayed there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it was a time of sorrow. His father, father turned his back on him because he became sin for us. He carried our sorrows. He mourned and he grieved over the condition of humanity. So what is mourning? Mourning is the expression of deep sorrow and grief. Uh, one put it this way, that, uh, that uh, mourning and uh, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes 
in the morning. Uh, we, we realize that there's a time that we all mourn. We've mourned the loss of a loved one. We've mourned uh, over sickness. We've mourned over different things. Uh, but the understanding about this, that it may have been a cause of uh, whatever caused that mourning, whether it was a loss or whether it was a tragedy, uh, each one of us at some point of our lives has known that deep sorrow, that grief. Uh, but it seems that Jesus, though, is pointing more towards uh, uh, a greater point than the sorrow of a loss or the sorrow of an emptiness, a broken heart uh, that is left with whatever the scenario may be that caused that, a tragedy that took place or, or whatever took, may have happened to cause that sorrow. He's, he's pointing to something more towards those who mourn over sin. He's talking more about those that mourn over sin's consequences. Do you ever just uh, sit back and, and look at sin and the consequences of sin that, that people who feel, I've got the right to do whatever I want to, but they're not free from the consequences of that, and now they're living the consequences of their sin. Do you ever sit back and or reflect in your prayer time of loved ones as, as we're praying for our lost loved ones? Do you ever just reflect of sin, the sin toll on their lives and just begin to look? It doesn't take very long to and take very much to see the toll that sin takes. I put an image on the screen a few services back of a beautiful young lady uh, uh, in one picture, but after sin's toll, how it just aged her by many years because the consequences of what sin will do. Uh, and we should be grieved by that. We should, there should be a mourning in our heart uh, about uh, the consequences uh, of this one nation under God has become a cesspool of sin that we live in. People uh, have taking uh, their liberty and their freedom. I, I posted a scripture today on our Facebook page from Galatians that says, uh, make not your liberty uh, a freedom to go and do what you want to. It's not a freedom, Paul said, of the flesh. Uh, it's not a liberty to do what we want to. Uh, and so we should see that uh, there's consequences. And he's talking about those that mourn. Uh, there, there's many throughout the Bible uh, that did that, that grieved uh, and mourned over the sins of their people. Uh, but two that stick out is Daniel and Nehemiah. They, they are examples of great mourning over sin, the sin of their selves, but also the sins of those that they were closest to, what they would call their people. Anybody here got some people? We got people. You are my people. My family's my people, whether it's blood or, or not blood, uh, that we have people. And so we have people, we've got folks, we've got the, the, the crew that we, we are dear to us. Uh, and at some point that we mourn, uh, I don't know about you, but it bothers me when I fall into sin's trap. It, it, it convicts me and it troubles me when I know that, that I, I slid down that slippery slope that the enemy put there and devil standing back laughing saying, I see you gave in. But it not only bothers me when I do that, it bothers me when I, my, my people, my, my comrades, my friends, my family, when I know that they have fell for the devil's trap and and they've given in to sin and the consequences of sin see we we can get our feet back under us and, and if we're strong in the lord and none of us are exempt from satan trying to take us out but we, we realize that we're responsible for ourselves that we work out our soul's our own salvation with fear and trembling. So we pull ourselves together or we rebound or we recover or we repent. But Daniel and Nehemiah both showed examples of men that not only repented for themselves, but they repented for their people. Think about Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a cupbearer for the king. He's nowhere near his homeland. He gets word from a servant. How, how's it going back in my homeland? How, how, how's, how's folks back home? Uh, and he, he's been far away from home for a long time. Somebody comes in. How's it going back at the house? How's it going back at uh, the hometown? Imagine if you got this report. You move away. How's it going back in Middleburg? Oh, Middleburg's been burned with fire. It's destroyed. All the, all the borders are broke down. It's a mess. It's horrible. What would happen? Your heart would sink from your chest 
to your stomach. That's what Nehemiah, that was a report that Nehemiah got, that his, his home, his family was there, his friends were there, his, his uh, people that he grew up, his people was there. Uh, so what did Nehemiah do? Nehemiah and Daniel both did the same thing. Daniel mourned for three weeks with fasting. And that's where people get the Daniel fast from. He just, uh, uh, you find that in Daniel 9 and Daniel 10 that he's just, he's, he's mourning and he's praying uh, for three weeks and he's wanting to hear from God about this situation. Uh, Nehemiah also did that. He mourned and fasted. Uh, but this is what Nehemiah declared uh, after he got this message. Uh, he goes and he begins to pray. Nehemiah 1 and 4 says, It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. If you read on, you find that Nehemiah did not just pray. He repented. He said, Lord, forgive me. He wasn't even there. But he said, Lord, forgive me. Maybe for not being there. Maybe for not praying enough. Uh, maybe he felt like he could have prayed more. He could have done. Did, did you ever take that responsibility on yourself when, when a loved one falls short or comes up short? You're thinking, man, what could have I done different? What, what could have I said? Maybe that's where Nehemiah was at. Maybe I could have done something to prevent this. Uh, and if there was anything that I could have or should have uh, or would have done, is what Nehemiah is saying, forgive me, Lord. Uh, and he's saying, Lord, forgive my people. Forgive them for whatever has happened. Uh, forgive the fact that the watchman uh, left the watchtower. Uh, he wasn't pointing fingers and making an excuse and trying to get somebody on the phone and saying, why was the watchman not in the watchtower? Uh, but he didn't go to the people. Uh, and when he got there, he didn't criticize them and say, why did you let this happen? Uh, but when he shows up on the scene and he evaluates and assesses the situation and he gets there to help, uh, he said, you see the great distress that, we are in. Why? Because those were his people. Those were his people. He didn't have to go there, but he did. He didn't have to mourn over them, but he did. We should get that kind of heart. We should realize that, yes, yes, it is part of the Christian walk. It should be a great part of our Christian walk to be joyful because the joy of the Lord is our strength. We should be the happiest people on the face of this planet. Why? Because of the redemption of God, the redeeming power of God that's taken place in our life. We can't go around with a, uh, that little puppy dog in the cartoon. I can't remember his name that's always down. It's, like, well, it's a joy to be a Christian. That's not going to get any testimony out of what we're talking about of bringing reconciliation to, to people's life, reconciling God, people back to God. But we should be joyful, but there is a time to mourn. There is a time for us. Nehemiah mourned, Daniel mourned, and you could just find one after another. Now, the apostle Paul, he was a great advocate of rejoicing. Apostle Paul wrote these words. He said, Rejoice in the Lord. And if that ain't enough, again, I say, rejoice. Uh, that's a guy that believes in rejoicing. Uh, he said, by the way, that I tell you, uh, rejoice. It's joy, unspeakable, full of glory, uh, overflowing within. Uh, but he also realized the necessity of mourning over the church's failures. Uh, we cannot, we must be joyful people. We must rejoice. Uh, but we cannot rejoice uh, over failures of what the body of Christ is supposed to be doing. We cannot rejoice over the fact that we did not take advantage of opportunities to do what God has called us to to do we have to have this realization of knowing the time to rejoice there may be times in your life that you just want to rejoice because everything is going good see i stand there often as a pastor there, there's times that i i come to the house of the lord i'm just ready to worship enter into his gates with uh, you know his courts with thanksgiving enter into his courts with praise his gates with thanksgiving and just rejoice and just uh, just have uh, not just a praise break but a praise service just begin to worship him praise him and magnify him uh, wanting to rejoice uh, but i realize and i come to the conclusion sometimes uh, though i want to rejoice and though i have all reason to rejoice i look over here 
and I see a whole section empty. Then I come over here, and I see a whole section empty. And I look here. Thank God for you. Praise the Lord for you. Not just because you're here to hear me, because you're my people, but the ones that are supposed to be filling those seats are my people. So on one hand, we're rejoicing, but on the other hand, we're mourning that people do not make the house of God a priority. And if they're not making the house of God a priority, that's a great concern for their spiritual walk because what God has given me as a pastor to, to deliver on Wednesday nights uh, over these last several months uh, that we've just been going through, being a gifted people, being a called people, being a fruitful people, being a blessed people, this is stuff that we need to know. This is stuff that need, we need to absorb, stuff that we need to, to take in uh, and, and take hold of. Uh, but there's times that we really want to rejoice, and that's where Paul was. Uh, I'm a great advocate of rejoicing, but we, we've got to realize that uh, even in our rejoicing, that we need to mourn uh, over the fact that there are people that, uh, that they've, they're not taking their salvation experience and their walk with God as serious as they ought to. And that should be troubling. We should mourn over the church's failures. We should mourn over the fact that 98%, I can't get away from that statistic, uh, 98% of Christians uh, that were surveyed uh, said they've never won anyone to the Lord. 85% said that they never even tried. 65% said they never heard the Great Commission. I know I've shared those stats with you, but they're staggering to me to know that. Uh, I mourn over that because that's a failure of the body of Christ, failure of us uh, who profess to be uh, the salt of the earth uh, and uh, the light of the world. Uh, that is something that we should mourn over. That's something we should be weeping in the prayer closet about uh, and saying, Lord, I repent for me. I repent for my people. I, I repent for, for that fact that we're missing the mark. Uh, Solomon tells us there's a time to weep, there's a time to laugh, but he also said there's a time to mourn in Ecclesiastes 3 and 4. David said in Psalm 51 and 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. Anybody ever just felt broken? Brokenness hurts. Brokenness hurts. I've experienced it. You've experienced it at some point. If you've lived any amount of time in this world, you've experienced it. The writer said that the man that lives in this world is full of sorrows. There's sorrow there. There's brokenness there. But not all brokenness is a bad thing, though. We need to come broken before God. We need to come into his presence and, and realize that. Th the woman with the alabaster box let us know that real quick, that not all brokenness is bad. That, she broke that alabaster box there. Uh, all of her prized possessions, everything, all of her living was there. But the greatest thing came from brokenness. Uh, so we need to realize this, that, uh, that both Solomon and David knew that the path to recovery leads through the valley of Mourning. What are you talking about, Pastor? Blessed are those that mourn. Lost that is not mourned will turn into a buried and festering sore. If you do not mourn, if you do not, uh, many, some people say, I'm just not going to think about it. I just, I'm not going to deal with it. I've seen people uh, lose a loved one. They never dealt with it. Festered up. It, it causes more problems than it's worth. And so lost, or excuse me, lost that is not mourned, we said, will turn into buried and festering sore. But loss must be expressed and grieved before it can be healed and overcome. So what did Paul do to that church at Corinth, that letter he wrote, things that he said to them? He, he went on and on with them. He rebuked them. Why? Because they failed to mourn over the sin in their midst. They chose rather to rejoice over their giftedness than to mourn over the sin that surrounded them everywhere. I, I really don't think that we're being real effective if we just always spend all of our time rejoicing about how good we have it when we don't mourn and have a burden for lost souls and how bad and how far out they're gone. And it's not about telling them how bad they are, but it's about weeping over their soul, 
when they refuse to weep over their soul. It's about weeping and, and being grieved about their sin when they're not even grieved about their sin. It's about caring of the fact that they're away from God when it seems like they don't even care that they're away from God. Blessed are those that mourn over sin and sin's consequences. Uh, James gave us a great challenge as the church uh, to mourn and weep. Uh, why? So the Lord may lift us up. He said in verses uh, 7 through 10 of James chapter 4, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Uh, those who mourn are blessed uh, because they will be comforted by God. There's five forms that I want to go over real quickly of how God will bring that comfort. Blessed are those that mourn. We laid out pretty significantly there about mourning and what he's talking about sin and sin's consequences uh, but he said blessed are those that mourn for god will comfort them and and what are those comforts here it is number one it comes in the form of consoling words of promise first thessalonians four eighteen. wherefore comfort one another with these words Number two, God goes beyond comforting words and works on our behalf to make things right. Joel 2, 25, 26 says, And I will restore to you the years. We, we've held on to this scripture for the last two years. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Number three, comfort will come to all of God's people when he returns, Revelations 21, 3 and 4, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither should there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. We are, number four, we are comforted by the present ministry of the Holy Spirit through the Holy Ghost. Romans 8, 26, 27, Paul declares this, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, uh, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us uh, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Uh, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Finally, number five, we are comforted by the love of of our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Philippians 2, 1 and 2, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Our spirituality is not experienced in isolation we are a part of the body of Christ. We are a part. We should not rejoice alone. We should not mourn alone. Uh, but God will bring comfort for those uh, who do mourn. Uh, when we mourn over sins and sin's consequences, God says, I'm going to bring comfort. We're a part not only of the body of Christ, but the kingdom of God. Uh, blessed are those that mourn. Uh, and he said here for, that there in our text there, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, and then he said, blessed uh, are those... Uh, Blessed are the meek. Let me get back down here. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, each of the eight Beatitudes that really stand in bold contrast of the ways of the world. As we started this off saying that we would pick all of these and we would think in this regard, well, when you think of the Beatitudes, there, there's this very stark contrast of the ways of the world 
But the practice of meekness, to think about that meekness, it may be the most disregarded by society. Because society tells you meekness is weakness. I've already told you a few services ago, the most humble man and the most meek man that we find in the Old Testament, Moses. He was very well known for that. You study the life of Moses, you find that to be so true. But it's so disregarded in society today. One well-respected uh, Greek dictionary carries the name Bauer. It gives this definition of meekness, or this description, I should say. Not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. Not being overly impressed with yourself. You're not all that in a bag of chips, is what he's saying. But today's world, though, being out there sounding the alarm, trumpeting out for everyone to hear of uh, uh, all of your accomplishments and boasting of all how important we are, that, that's a common thing in our society today. So meekness in this society is little appreciated. Little appreciated. But you know, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. Strength under control. Now, it may be said it's meekness is weakness, but it's a radical ability to have strength, but yet have it under control. You can have strength, and you don't have to trumpet how great you are. But how do you do that? Well, meekness is this radical submission. What did James say? Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So it's a radical submission to God. And it is complete confidence in oneself and one's importance and one's ability I got this, or I'm strong enough, or I don't need any help. I can figure it out on my own. No, that's when we think confidence, that's what the world's telling you. Have confidence in yourself, believe in yourself, and da 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 da. Well, we need to quit having self confidence. We need to get some more God confidence. It's submission to God and a complete confidence in Him that enables us to hear and to bear injustice calmly and patiently. The meek know their God. Right? I know. I don't, I just heard about God. I've got to know Him. I don't know how long ago it was that you got saved, that you got born again, but I can stand here all these years later probably 30 plus for me and stand and say I met the Lord when I knelt down at that altar and I can tell you after all of these highs and all of these lows after long nights of weeping and mourning for myself and for others I can tell you I know my God he's been in time he's been on time he's been a very I, I've read in this word that he'd be a present help in time of trouble but then I got in trouble, and you know what I found out? Truth, he was a very present help in time of trouble. I found out that he was a refuge from every storm. Then the storm clouds rolled in, and you know what I found out? He's a refuge from every storm. So there's one thing uh, to, to learn about God. There's another thing to know your God. And so the meek know their God. They know Him. They know Him personally. They know Him intimately. They know Him uh, deeply. Therefore, they do not need to prove themselves to others. I don't have to prove myself to anybody of who I am or what I am or what I'm able to accomplish. But we're supposed to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2, when he tells us to be a living sacrifice, it's not to prove ourselves to. There's two places in Scripture 
Malachi and there in Romans 12 that speaks about proving. And it's not talking about proving ourselves. It's saying prove God. Prove who he is. Prove what his will is. Uh, he said, do this and see what will happen. It will prove uh, me. So the meek know their God, and they need not prove them, uh, to prove themselves to others. So in the kingdom of God, we have an admonishment. And what is that admonishment? Blessed are the meek. So we've got a call. We've got a mandate. Uh, the Beatitudes are not just suggestions uh, to say, well, if you do these things, then this is what will happen. It's not a give-and-take scenario. The kingdom of God, we're admonished to practice meekness, not when we feel like it, not when it's convenient to us, not when it would make us save face. Right? People love, that's what they want. They want to save face or save the other end, save your butt. A lot of people, it, it's about covering oneself it's about man i've got myself in a mess now i need to get myself out of it too many people they wait until their life's a mess and they're in trouble and then they all of a sudden oh i need to be meek i need to pray i need to talk to god i need to submit to god i need to get back with god i need to straighten this thing out well if you wait until then to pray if you wait until you're in trouble to pray you're in trouble it's a practice. It's a daily walk. It's a daily character trait. Blessed are the meek. And it flows from a heart that is submitted to God. So when the need arises to defend our beliefs, we've got instruction for that too. Listen to what Peter told us in 1 Peter 3 and 15. He said, Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So when doing good works, the meek will show by their conduct that their works are done in meekness. Meekness is required when hearing the Word of God. Meekness is necessary in our relationship with others. Meekness is required... When leading other people. Second Timothy two, twenty four, twenty five. Paul wrote this. Some scholars say that Second Timothy was the last letter that Paul wrote before he died. I was listening a little bit today of a, an audio book on the life of Paul. And you realize when I began to listen to that how young of a man Paul was when he died. He was early 60s, late 50s, if they're correct in their syn synopsis of when he died. But what he wrote here, some of these were some of his last words. We know that it was some of his last words because he also wrote to Timothy in these letters, the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the fight, I've kept the faith. But listen to what he wrote to him in 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 when he talks about meekness is a necessity to serve meekness is a necessity in our relationship with others meekness is a necessity when receiving the word of god he said a servant of the lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patience here's that word again in meekness instructing those get this in meekness instructing those that oppose, not them, not those that oppose you, but those that oppose themselves. Don't you realize that there's some people out there that they don't even comprehend that they're opposing themselves. They're destroying themselves. They're making choices to go after sin I've told people over and over and over again, some people have told me over the years, well, prove to me in the Bible that smoking is wrong. I said, I don't have to. I said, hand me your cigarette pack. Right there on the side, this junk will kill you, is what it should say. It gives you a warning. 
You don't even realize that uh, that that you're taking that deep draw on. Uh, you're opposing yourself. You're filling your lungs with tar. Uh, you're killing yourself. Uh, that alcoholic, uh, show me in the Bible where I don't have to drink. Let me show you a picture of your liver after you've drunk for a while. And so they don't even realize this. So Paul is telling Timothy in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, uh, if God peradventure will give them repentance uh, to an acknowledging of the truth. What is he saying here? Uh, He's saying they're doing everything to destroy themselves, but let them know, uh, instruct them in meekness, uh, instruct them not arrogantly, uh, but instruct them in such a way that God, uh, to let them know that God's mercy and grace peradventure will give them repentance. Uh, What is it? the ministry of reconciliation that we're telling them you've done everything to restore yourself but as I said Sunday God takes trade-ins you've got yourself to the point that as I said Sunday you're push pull tug or tow but God said if you can push pull tug and tow yourself to this altar and fall across it I'll give you a brand new life I will restore to you the years uh, that everything you've done to oppose yourselves. Uh, he said, I'll make you a new creature through Christ Jesus. And Paul's telling Timothy, That's, we're going to need meekness to do that. To lead people to Christ, we've got to be meek. We've got to have this meekness instructing those in patience, he said, apt to teach in patience. So blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, these words of Jesus challenge us, or they should, to be different from the world. Really, all eight of these Beatitudes should challenge us to be different from the world because, really, the world's not going to embrace these Beatitudes. The, the, the world's not going to embrace these concepts of Jesus that he starts out his Sermon on the Mount with. Meekness was not just in Jesus' most notable sermon that got the title, Sermon on the Mount, that he spent two chapters preaching. Meekness was a part of his character. If you were to see the man Jesus that walked uh, on the face of the earth 33 and a half years, the man that at some point here probably in his late 30s, early 30s possibly. Uh, This is at the the onset, the beginning of his ministry uh, that stands up there on that mount. Uh, This 30-year-old man or 31-year-old man or however old he was, uh, he was a man, flesh and blood. Uh, He stood there and he was speaking and he was talking. Uh, These were the words of God, but they were coming through the lips of a man that some accepted as the Messiah, that some accepted as Master, some accepted uh, as a teacher but some called him a blasphemer some said he was a a a madman he was a man uh, that was uh, opposed to everything religious Uh, regardless of what they thought of him uh, meekness was a part of his character uh, and it should be a part of our character as christians because what does it mean to be christian christ-like Matter of fact, a more accurate interpretation of the word Christian is little Christ. They don't make us little gods, but that means that we're a reflection of the likeness and of the image of God. But his word, he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we've got a promise. If we live in this meekness, if we serve in this meekness, if we read and search the word in meekness, if we use in our relationship with other meekness, if we lead others to him uh, with the ministry of reconciliation in meekness, uh, he said, I've got a promise for you. Uh, His word is a promise. Uh, His word is a promise for us. And and you know what promise does? It gives us hope. Uh, Paul wrote this in Romans 5 and 2, by whom also we have access by faith into the grace uh, wherein we stand and rejoice and hope uh, of the glory of God. Uh, He said, blessed uh, are those, uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, He said that you shall have uh, this hope uh, that we have access by faith, uh, by one spirit, not just into the holy of holies, uh, but we have a promised land. Let us not, let us not make the mistake of saying, thinking that the promised land is everything will be 
great and better when I die and I finally make it to heaven. Heaven is our final resting place. It's our eternal life. But every Christian has a promised land here. What is that? A place in the kingdom of God. We shall inherit the earth. We shall inherit the earth. Now, if you look at statistics, Christians are minorities. We're the minority. But God said that the fullness of this world is ours. That we have to take it. He said the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. That would explain why we're almost feeling like to the point of overcome that we are the minority. He said, but the violent take it by force. So what does that mean? It means that we have to realize uh, how can we do that? How can we inherit the earth? Uh, this forcefulness that he's talking about, take it by earth. He said, no, do it with meekness. Take it by force, but enforce meekness and humility and standing in the word of God, mourning and weeping over them. So by whom we also, Paul said, have access by faith into the grace where we stand and rejoice in hope. When we can rejoice and hope for the, of the glory of God, you know what you've done? You've inherited the earth. He's, the Lord said, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. We need to step in the enemy's camp and take back what he stole. From. It's ours. It's ours. Those are your children. Those are your grandchildren. Those are your people, your family, your things. That's your joy. That's your peace. That's your wholeness of mind. That's your completeness. That's your salvation. That's ours. It's our land. We who are meek will inherit the earth. And so we have to realize that it belongs to those who are blessed people. We are blessed people, church. In closing tonight, our spirituality is expressed. How do we express our spirituality, some may ask. Our spirituality is expressed in our relationship to God. Number one. Because you can't have number two without number one. I don't believe. Our relationship with God and in our relationship with people around us. We are the body of Christ. We are a part of the kingdom of God. And so we're knowing that and knowing blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. As you stand with me, and we make our way to this altar to close out our Wednesday night study, word, the time of prayer, as we gather around these altars, and we begin to pray tonight. Let's pray about the impact of just just these two beatitudes two of eight mourning and meekness how much impact has mourning and meekness had on your walk your relationship with God and with others up to this point and how much more of an impact do you want it to have on your Christian walk as we move forward from this day in our Christian walk. Maybe tonight you can say, well, mourning and meekness has not been two of the top categories. But you say, an in-depth look at that makes me realize that I need to pay a little more attention or a lot more attention to these two Beatitudes. What kind of impact does it have on our life? Not just here in our life personally, our family, but our life in the church and our life out there and what we know is the world job, school wherever Galatians 6, 9 and 10 as we get ready to come and pray let us not be weary in well doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not as we have therefore opportunity and I guarantee you're going to have plenty, 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 plenty of opportunity. Let us do good unto all men. Everybody. 
Everybody? Everybody. What about the one that was mean to me? All men. What about the one that said ugly things to me? All men. What about the one that despised me and rejected me? You know what Jesus said? Hold not this sin to their charge. They know not what they do. All men. Especially unto them who are of the household of faith. I'll do whatever I can for anybody I can, but especially my people. My people. Who's your people? The people of God. The kingdom of God. My brothers and my sisters. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for this powerful, powerful message that some would look as elementary, be attitude, something you learn in children's church. My, what we can receive out of it as full-grown adults to know that blessed, 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 we're a blessed people. We're a blessed people. Blessed are the those that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Oh, we're a blessed people. Father God, help us to mourn more. Help us to be full of more meekness than ever before. And we gather around these altars, talk to you about these two beatitudes in our lives. Help us to be transformed into your likeness more and more. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you find your place to pray and just talk to the Lord about your relationship as it relates to these beatitudes tonight?